Heine Maria Hilke, Primal Sound. It must have been when I was a boy at school that the phonograph was invented. At any rate, it was at that time a chief object of public wonder. This was probably the reason why our science master, a man given too busy himself with all kinds of handiwork, encouraged us to try our skill in making one of these instruments from the material that lay nearest to hand. Nothing more than nothing more was needed than a piece of pliable cardboard bent to the shape of a funnel on the narrow orifice of which was stuck a piece of impermeable paper of the kind used to bottle fruit. This provided a vibrating membrane in the middle of which we stuck a bristle from a coarse clothes brush, brush at right angles to its surface. With these few things, one part of the mysterious machine was made. Receiver and reproducer was complete. It now only remained to construct the receiving cylinder, which could be moved close to the needle marking the sound by means of a small rotating handle. I do not remember what we made it for off. There was some kind of cylinder which we covered with a, th a thin coating of candle wax to the best of our ability. Our impatience brought to a pitch by the excitement of sticking and fitting the parts as we adjusted one another over it was such that the wax was scarcely cooled and hardened before we put our work to the test. How now this was done can easily be imagined. When someone spoke or sang into the funnel, the needle in the parchment transferred the sound waves to the receptive surface of the roll slowly turning beneath, beneath it. And then, when the moving needle was made to retrace its path, which had been fixed in the meantime with a coat of varnish, the sound which has, had been ours became, came back to us trembling, halting, halting from the paper funnel, uncertain, infinitely soft and hesitating and fading out altogether in places. Each time the fact was complete. Our class was not exactly one of the quietest, and there can be can have been a few moments in its history when it had been able as a body to achieve such a degree of silence. The phenomenon on every reception of it remained astonishing, indeed positively staggering. We were confronting, confronting, as it were, a new and infinitely delicate point in the texture of reality, from which something far greater than ourselves yet indescribably immature seemed to be appealing to us as if seeking help. At the time and all through the intervening years I believe that independent sound taken from us and preserved outside of us would be unforgettable, that it turned out otherwise in the cause of my writing the present account. As will be seen, what impressed itself on my memory most deeply was not the sound from the funnel, but the markings traced on the cylinder. These made a most definite impression. impression. I first became aware of these some 14 or 15 years after my school days were passed. It was during my first stay in Paris. At that time I was attending the anatomy lectures 
the called box arts with considerable enthusiasm. It was not so much the manifold interlacing of muscles, muscles and sinews, nor the complete inner agreement of the inner organs with other that appealed to me, but rather the bare skeleton, the restrained energy and elasticity of which I had already noticed when studying in the drawings of Leonardo. However much I puzzled over the structure of the whole, it was more than I could deal with. My attention I always reverted to the study of the skull, which seemed to me to constitute the utmost achievement, as it were, of which this chalky element was capable. It was as if it had been pursued to make just this part a special effort to render a decisive service by providing a most solid protection for the most daring feature of all, for something which, through itself narrowly confined, had a, a field of activity which was boundless. The fascination which this particular structure had for me reached such a pitch, finally, that I procured a skull in order to spend many hours of the night with it, and, as always happens with me and things, it was not only the moments of the deli deli deliberate attention which made this ambiguous object re reality mine. I owe my familiarity with it, beyond doubt, in part to that passing glance with which we involuntarily examine and perceive our daily environment when there exists any relationship to, at all between it and us. It was a passing glance of this kind which I suddenly checked in its course, making it exact and attentive. By candlelight, which is often so peculiarly alive and challenging, the coronal suture had some stri strikingly visible, had become strikingly visible, and I knew at once what it remain, rem, reminded me of, one of those unforgettable Gotten grooves which had been <coughs> scratched in a little wax cylinder by the points of a bristle. And now, I do not know, is it due to a rhythmic peculiarity of my imagination that ever since, often after the lapse of, of years, I repeatedly feel the impulse to make that spontaneously perceived similarity the starting point of a whole series of unheard experiments. I frankly confess that I always treated this desire, whenever it made itself felt, with the most unrelenting mistrust, if proof be needed, let it be found in the fact that only now, after more than a decade and a half, have I resolved to make cautious statement concerning it. Furthermore, there is nothing I can cite in favor of my idea beyond its obstinate recurrence, a recurrence which has taken me by surprise in all sorts of places, divorced from many connections with what I might be doing. What is it that repeatedly presents itself to my mind? It is this. The coronal suture of the skull, this would be first have to be investigated, has, let us assume, a certain similarity to the closely wavy line which the needle of a phonograph engraves on the rec receiving. Rotating cylinder 
of the apparatus of the what if one changed the needle and directed it on its turn and on its return journey along a tracing which was not delivered from the graphic translation of sound but existed of itself naturally well to put it plainly along the corner suture for example what would happen a sound would necessarily result a series of sounds music feelings which incredulity timidity fear all which of all feelings were possible prevents or here possible prevents me from suggesting a name for the primus, primal sound which would have which would then make its appearance in the world leaving that side for the moment uh, leaving that side for the moment what were the variety of lines that occurring anywhere could one not put under the needle or try out is there any contour that one could not in a sense complete in this way and then experience it as it makes itself felt to transformed in another field of sense at one period when i began to interest myself in arabic poems which seem to owe their existence to the simultaneous and equal contributions of all five senses it struck to me for the first time that the modern european poet makes use of these five contributions contributors singly and in very varying degrees only one of them sight overlay uh, overlapping with the world 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 seeming to dominate him constantly how is light by contrast is the contribution he receives from inattentive hearing not to speak of the interference interference of what of other senses which are active only on the periphery of the consciousness and with many interruptions within the limited sphere of their practical activity and yet the perfect poem can only materialize on condition that this world acted upon by all five levers simultaneously is seen under a finite aspect to the supernatural plane which is in fact the plane of the poem a lady to whom this was mentioned in conversation exclaimed that this wonderful and simultaneous capacity and achievement of all the senses was surely nothing but the presence of mind and grace of love incidentally she thoroughly she thereby bore, bore her own witness to the sublime reality of the poem but the lover is in such a splendid danger just because he must depend on the coordination of his senses for he knows that they must meet in that unique and risky center in which renouncing our extension they come together and have no permanence as i write this i have before me the diagram which i have always used used as a ready help whenever ideas of this kind have demanded attention if the words is if the words whole field of experience including those spheres which are beyond our knowledge be represented in a complete circle it will be immediately evident that when the black sectors denoting that which we are incapable of experiencing i measured against the lesser light sections corresponding to that which is illuminated by the senses 
the former are very much greater. Now the position of the lover is this, that he feels himself unexpectedly placed in the center of the circle, that is to say, at the point where, he, where the known and the incomprehensible come in forcibly together at one single point, become complete and simply a possession, losing thereby, it is true, our individual character. This position would not serve for the poet, for individual variety must be constantly present for him. He is compelled to use the sense sectors to their full extent, and it must also be in, the, in his aim to extend each of them as far as possible, so that his lively delight, good for the attempt, might be able to pass through the five gardens in one leap. As the lover's danger consists in the non-spatial character of his standpoint, so the poet, the poet, the poet, poet lies in his awareness of the abysses which divide the one order of sense experience from the other. In truth, they are sufficiently wide and engulfing to weep away from before us the greater part of the world. world. Who knows how many worlds? The, questions, the question arises here as to whether the extent of these sectors on the plane assumed by us can be enlarged by any vital degree by the work of research. The achievements of the microscope, of the telescope, and of so many devices which increase the range of the senses upwards and downwards, do they not lie in another sphere altogether, since most of the increase those achieved cannot be interpreted by the senses, cannot be experienced in any real sense? It is perhaps not mature to suppose that the artist who develops the five-fingered hand of his senses if one may put it so, to ever more active and more spiritual capacity, contributes more decisively than anyone else to a, an extension of the several senses field. Only the achievement which gives proof of this does not permit of this entering his personal extension of territory in the general map before us. Since it, since it is not only possible, in the last resort, by a miracle. But if we are looking for a way by which to establish the connection so urgently needed be, between the different provinces, now so strangely separated from one another, what could be more promising than the experiment suggested earlier in this record? If the writer ends by recommending it once again, he may be given a certain amount of credit for withstanding the temptation to give free reign to his fancy in imagine, imagining the results of the assumptions which he has suggested. So, on the way to the assumption of the Blessed Virgin. 1919.